Coming up, go big or go home. A different state of the city address for Mayor Sly James in front of teenagers at an area high school. Also this week, why streetcars are now passing over Brookside as new expansion plans are approved. Monday marks the deadline for enrolling in Obamacare. We track how Kansas City is doing with signups. Plus, school funding back in the news in Kansas. And also in Topeka, why Governor Brownback has just signed a law making it tougher for you to switch political parties. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more straight ahead on Week in Review. Glad you're with us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in this place we call home. Dissecting those stories this week from 41 Action News, Garrett Hake from behind the microphone at News Radio 981 FM KMBZ, Scott Parks from the pages of the Kansas City Star political reporter, blogger and columnist Dave Helling, and rounding out the cozy confines of our Week in Review table, investing investigative journalist Stacey Cameron. This week, Kansas City Mayor Sly James delivered his State of the City address, but with a twist, he made his annual speech at Park Hill High School north of the river in front of an audience of mostly high school students. Students, uh, I know it's going to be hard, but I want you to close your eyes and imagine that at one point in time, I was actually your age. <laughs> so I'm going to just tell you straight up. During the past few years, Kansas City has had it going on. We were named the top 10 travel destination in the U.S., one of six best cities in the country to start a business, and in the top 20 cities to raise a family. Also, I want to tell you, Newsweek also said the Kansas City's mayor uh, was one of the top five innovative mayors in the country. <laughs> and clearly, they know what they're talking about. But there's a couple of ways we can be tripped up when it comes to continuing our forward momentum. Now, simply put, our crime rate is too high and has been for far too long. So I'd like for you guys to do something for me. I'd like all the students in the room, look under your seats, please. And if you have a card under your seat with the State of the City logo on it, please stand up. Those people standing up represent 106 people who died last year in homicides in Kansas City. Answered questions from teens in a mini town hall meeting. Was there a reason, though, for the North of the River venue and, for that matter, delivering his annual address to predominantly a teenage crowd, Dave Helling? Well, I think the political reason for going north of the river, Nick, of course, is to try and include the voters up there in some sense of Kansas City as a community. There are various efforts over time to sort of uh, reach out to the Northland, which often feels like it is left out of the discussion. And of course, speaking to teenagers is a classic political trick as well, because you don't expect difficult questions from the teenagers. Certainly they have interests and they're not unintelligent, but you're not going to get the kind of questions that you might get from people who have a more vested interest in what's going on at City Hall. And so it's kind of a safe audience. It's a little bit of a stunt, reaches out to the Northland. It's all good. And it was an astute move then, you think, for the mayor, Stacey? Well, I, I think it was because the state of the city address isn't something that typically gets that kind of coverage. Dave hit it right on the nail. It's a bit of a stunt by going to the uh, high school crowd. But I think Dave makes a really good point. Having it the first of the year just moved north of the river to that part of the city, having lived downtown prior to that, you do see a lack of coverage up there. And it does feel like you're not part of the discussion in the city. So it was a deft move by the mayor. But uh, it, interesting that one of the the first clips and things that he spoke about was the homicide rate, maybe the biggest issue next to education that faces this mayor as he goes forward. Garrett. And if it was a stunt, it was a smart stunt because of that idea of education. So, I mean, you look at, you got 400 high school students. These are kids who would never have watched the state of the city otherwise. I mean, the folks who are really interested in this know exactly where they can find it streaming live or they can read it in the paper the next day. But you bring it to that new audience. And I think one of the most interesting things he said in this speech was the idea that he was going to become much more engaged on education. Up to this point, we've seen a mayor focus on essentially two issues, attendance and literacy, when it comes to education in all the schools within the boundaries of Kansas City. I'll be curious to see if he's going to dive deeper into the problems of Kansas City public schools specifically 
over the course of the next year after kind of setting the table to be more active. I want to bring up a, a sore point for you, Scott Parks, but let me get into this because at one point during his speech, the mayor showed a photo of a poorly maintained parking lot with a flimsy folding chair at its center. The next photo was that same spot and what it looks like today. That's the way it looked like then. This is the way it looks like now. <laughs> cavemen and women, and cavemen, it stands for citizens against virtually everything, um, <laughs> were quick to come up with every reason why that project shouldn't move forward. But I I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Which do you think makes for a better downtown? The car in the lot or the Sprint Center? 2014 will be a year that we decide one very basic question. We're either going to go big or we're going to go home. All righty, this reference to cave people didn't sit well with you, did it, Scott? Now, no, why, why not? Well, I, I think when you say that it's a very creative acronym, I'll give him credit for that. Uh, but I think when you refer to people who have legitimate questions and concerns about portions of his agenda, and, and that's what the cavemen and women are. They're people, and I'm included to some extent in that group. I am against some of the things that this mayor is pushing. But when you think in your mind's eye, uh, when you hear the word caveman, you think of someone who's dumb, someone who drags their knuckles around. And uh, while the acronym is creative, I think it's somewhat derogatory to refer to your political opponents in that way. And I think the mayor was, you know, I credit him for all the political reasons that Dave and Stacey and Garrett have mentioned. It was a smart political move. I just thought that that quip was a little bit below the belt. Dave? Well, the other thing I, I think we need to pay a little bit of attention to, when, when the mayor shows a before and after picture like he did in the clip you just uh, showed, Nick, he invites reporters to drive 15 <coughs> miles east of the Sprint Center and take a few pictures and show what other parts of this community look like and where other parking lots might be and houses in disrepair and neighborhoods in shambles. Uh, the people who are against virtually everything sometimes argue that that money might be better spent in those areas. So they're not necessarily against downtown and the Sprint Center, but they are against not investing in places which also need help and, and, and as I suggest, a before and after picture like that virtually invites us to, to give that some consideration. And yeah, those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Exactly I mean, right. You can be developing east of Prospect and do downtown. I mean, I just came back from St. Louis. I was covering the NCAA tournament there. Their arena downtown is in a wasteland. I mean, you have to walk three or four blocks to find a single place to eat. The difference in having a vibrant downtown can't be overstated in what it does for your city beyond just what it is downtown. But that, that is true. There are those problems. But I don't think it has to be an either or conversation. Well, and I think the mayor makes a, a huge misstep, especially in this caveman reference. Uh, what I think he's really getting at is not opposition that existed, and it wasn't nearly what the mayor, I think, wants it to be, opposition to the Sprint Center years back, uh, which was relatively a popular idea for the most part. Uh, what he's referring to, I think, are people who are opposed to building a one-terminal KCI now and a streetcar line that, that some people think is extremely, I'm myself included, extremely expensive. Uh, but if, if being against the KCI one terminal project makes you a caveman or a cave woman, then about 75% of the people that live in this city are cavemen and women. The problem comes here. Uh, I'll disagree with Scott to this degree. It's every major project that this city touts about possibly building or every major event that they want to bring in. There are the naysayers. It seems everybody always wants to be critical of Kansas City. And as a person who now lives here for four years but isn't from Kansas City, I think a lot of people in the surrounding areas want to call this place a cow town. But if you look at St. Louis, if you look in an Indianapolis, if you look at an Oklahoma City, any city that kind of compares, they don't have the downtown that we have. They don't have the vibrancy that we have. The problem here is when we push these types of projects, we literally shove them down <clears throat> people's throats. We don't necessarily look at the proper way to fund them. So the mayor's right. Things like the Sprint Center, the idea of building uh, a, a streetcar system, a limited streetcar system, a convention center hotel, everybody wants to negate that, or a new convention center, or the terminal. We need to talk about these because Kansas City can't remain to be in the 80s and 90s where nearly every building in this downtown was shuttered. We need to move forward, but we need to do it in a smart way. We can't continue to raise 
sales taxes and property assessments and expect the federal government to pay the tab. That's where Kansas City is getting it wrong. We build these things on taxpayer backs and then we don't maintain them. That's where we get ourselves in trouble. Politically, he needs to figure out how to co-opt these people and not make it a, a, a butting heads against the caveman. I mean, the people who want to vote no on some of these projects, I guarantee, Scott, there, even for you, there are some of these things that that there's no uh, there's no umbrella group of everyone who is really right. against everything. And the trick is to figure out how to pick those people off and co-opt them on some of these projects and prove they can be done. Okay, also this week, the head of Johnson County was delivering his state of government address. Nearly 700 people gathered at the Ritz-Charles in Overland Park to hear Ed Eilert speak. Now, KCPT certainly didn't stream his speech live. There weren't banks of TV cameras there. Why the absence of News Inc.? After all, Johnson County has about 100,000 more people living there than Kansas City, Missouri. Dave Helling? Well, uh, there are several reasons. First of all, let's just be clear. Even the state of the city from the mayor in Kansas City, Missouri, and the state of the county from Ed Eilert are not overwhelmingly important events just in and of themselves. I challenge anyone at this table or in this community to quote me one line from Mayor James' State of the City address a year ago. <laughs> we don't remember it. We don't even remember States of the Union address addresses. So it's not, just as, a, as an empirical matter, it's not that important of an event. And then there are just not as many controversies in Johnson County, and Nick, as there are in Kansas City, Missouri. Johnson County isn't considering a new airport. Johnson County isn't considering really uh, uh, light rail transit or fixed rail transit of any kind. Uh, the other issues. We we talk about they certainly don't have arguably the crime problem that Kansas City, Missouri does. So in an era of finite resources, sometimes people, you know, pick and choose, and that's what I think happened here. Stacy. Well, I, I, I disagree that there aren't necessarily the controversies brewing in Johnson County that there are in Kansas City. They just don't get the, the coverage. Look, you've got uh, rising poverty level rates in Johnson County. You have a growing number of kids who are now uh, relying on reduced lunch. You have issues with the mental health facilities in Johnson County. You have what, $3.6 million spent on King Louis, a bowling center that still isn't being utilized. There's a lot of things. There is an, a, a bit of an uptick in, in certain types of, you know, petty crimes. It, it's not the homicide, right? By no means, and it never will be in Johnson County. But there are serious issues uh, facing Johnson County uh, that just simply in the mainstream media don't get the coverage. So, it, yeah, it's popular or it's easy to cover a murder in Kansas City, Missouri, but it's not so easy for the media to cover something like more kids in Johnson County, which is supposed to be the economic pearl of this area, that are needing reduced uh, lunch and people, more and more people in that area that are slipping below the federal poverty now, line. I don't disagree with that, but I would say, Nick, that the state of the county address is not the way to cover those stories. And I think Stacy would okay, agree with Garrett. that. And speaking as the kind of person who would have to go out and cover those stories, I can tell you, you look at the demographics, there's no way that mainstream media, particularly television in this town, wants to ignore Johnson County. If there's a way to do those stories, we're going to go out and do them. That's where the eyeballs are from a purely cynical TV perspective. But in terms of the state of the county address, if there's not an action item, if there's not a, yeah, but here's what we're going to do about it next way to push that story forward, it's a speech, it's a political statement, but it doesn't provide any, any real way to jump into those stories. Monday marks the deadline for signing up for Obamacare, and the push was on in Kansas City this week to sign up procrastinators, though a recent Kaiser Health tracking poll finds that six in ten uninsured adults remain unaware of the Monday deadline. How are signups going in our bi-state area? According to Kaiser Foundation figures, as of March 1st, a little more than 74,000 people in Missouri had signed up for plans. That's only about 11% of the potential number of enrollees. In Kansas, just over 29,000 had enrolled, under 10% of the potential number. Both are a far cry from the 14.8% of potential enroll enrollees signed up for plans nationwide. Why is that? Well, in part because, Nick, there, and we've talked about this on this show, there doesn't seem to have been the local kind of outreach, at least until recent uh, weeks, that you've seen in other parts of the country. Remember, the legislatures in Missouri and Kansas have been vociferously opposed to this bill, so the idea of spending any money to sort of communicate with the public has been very difficult to find. We have not expanded Medicaid in either state. Some of the Medicaid problems may be reflected in these numbers. Uh, you know, uh, this is an extraordinarily difficult population to, to reach under the best of circumstances, uh, the uninsured population. You really do have to work pretty hard at it, and Kansas and Missouri, by and large, has decided not to do so, and that, I think that's why we're behind a little bit. But I did see on your air, uh, Garrett, uh, efforts by churches now. There are even robocalls from the mayor of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, the mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, mm -hmm. calling people 
people uh, at, ho at their homes even to try and sign up well, that's for right. I mean, the Affordable now, Care Act. There's now an attempt to use the sort of grassroots infrastructure of the Democratic Party both here locally and then has been built up nationally to go out and reach some of these people to use the machine that was able to find these people when they were voters and find them again now as uninsured citizens and try to at least educate people about this bill. The more you read, the more you cover this, the more you realize how much rank and file regular citizens don't really even understand what's in the Affordable Care Act even to this day. It's been law of the land for several years now. Well, Dave talks about opposition. As Monday's deadline approaches, the Kansas House votes this week to remove the Sunflower State from the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. A House bill sponsored by a Shawnee Republican <coughs> passed 74 to 48 and commits Kansas to join a health care compact, a hypothetical network of states that will be allowed to set up their own health insurance regulations separate from the Affordable Care Act. It now goes to the Senate. But does Kansas have the authority to unilaterally remove itself from the provisions of the Affordable Care Act? Well, there's this troubling little document called the Constitution oh, okay. that would probably suggest that they don't. Uh, and I would only point them to the clause regarding interstate commerce and the supremacy clause. It's not unlike, Nick, what they're trying to do in Kansas is not unlike what some lawmakers in Missouri are trying to do to negate them from having to follow any sort of federal gun laws. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a practice that is uh, based, I think, in some parts in insanity and futility. But it's not just this type of effort. You've also got an effort in Kansas to also now provide criminal background checks for uh, the navigators that they have in the state of Kansas as well, Stacey. Right, deeper regulations, uh, the concern uh, allegedly on paper being that they worry that these uh, people who would sign them up are going to get access to private information of the people who would enroll, uh, address, social security number, uh, certain uh, issues regarding their health, are they a smoker or non-smoker. So the concerns of identity theft. So so they don't want people who would have a background, uh, a criminal background or issues of fraud. But uh, it, it looks more like that's a roadblock to uh, continue to stall the implementation of Obamacare in Kansas. We see that there's not going to be a massive, uh, any increase in Medicare or Medicaid coverage in either of the states because they're opposition to this. But really, we're looking at a, a population of folks, Nick, uh, that, that are kind of facing two hurdles. A, many of them have never had insurance, and if they had had insurance in the past, it was through an employer. And secondly, the means of signing up, we've got to realize this, is basically online or to go to a, a set station to to, to fill out the forms, and a lot of these people who are below the poverty line don't have either of those means. So to get the information, first of all, to know what to do or where to go is difficult for them, and then to actually get there and do it makes it even more difficult. Well, this has been a failure across the board on both sides of the political Just quickly, aisle. the other thing to keep in mind is that to, to sign up for this coverage, at least nominally, you have to pay something. You have to buy insurance. There are tax credits and other ways to help people to afford it, but I'm not sure that's clear at all to the target population. And people who are really struggling to make ends meet anyway, it's hard to convince them to go in to use, as Stacy suggests, a computer they may not know how to use to pay more money for something they think they might not use. It's all a right. tough deal. For more original reporting on the Affordable Care Act, the deadline, and Medicaid expansion, as Stacy mentions, in Kansas and Missouri, go to kcpt.org slash health. Next on Week in Review, streetcar expansion approved in Kansas City, but Brookside won't be getting on board, literally. It seems to me that we have a lack of transparency, yes. we have a lack of honesty, and that creates a great deal of acrimony from the public you're trying to sell. Opponents of Kansas City's streetcar line are celebrating the news that the city won't be expanding the line south into Brookside during the next phase. The end of the line will now be at UMKC instead of going further south towards the Brookside and Waldo areas. Brookside residents voicing strong opposition to extending the streetcar line. This week, the city council approves adding three new routes that would run on in Independence Avenue to Benton Boulevard, on Linwood Boulevard to Prospect Avenue and south on Main Street to UMKC, eight miles in all, at a cost of nearly half a billion dollars. That report coming from you, Garrett Hake. Uh, but tell me, what is the objection, though, to those Brookside residents? Well, you'd think that everybody would want extra transportation in their neighborhoods. W why don't they want that? There's a couple things going on here. First, in Kansas City, culturally, this is not New York City. Folks okay. do not take public transportation to work, by and large. There is not a culture of, I'm going to get on the bus to go to work. I lived in New York for five years. You make a million bucks a year, you're still taking the subway and bus to get to work. That doesn't exist here, first of all. In Brookside specifically, I heard two different sets of complaints that sort of fed into each other. 
One was that the streetcar would change the character of the neighborhood. There were concerns that it would disrupt the trolley trail, that it would disrupt trees, that it would just sort of disrupt the sort of old-time character of Brookside. And the second was more purely financial. If you are part of the TDD, the district that would uh, encompass the streetcar, particularly if you live near the line, you would see an increase not just in sales tax within the TDD, but also an increase in your property tax that could add up to hundreds of dollars per year for some of the more expensive homes in Brookside. And a lot of folks who were never going to ride this streetcar said they just didn't want to pay for it. So what happens now? Is this a positive thing politically for the broader expansion of streetcars, Dave Helling? Uh, well, I think that's one of the reasons they want to shrink the district, because by doing that, by taking Brookside out, you can shrink the TDD. You can limit the number of people who will vote and, and, and potentially exclude the Brooksiders, the Waldo people, who are not happy with this proposal, and instead get a good turnout on the east side. There is now discussion, of course, of extending it along Independence Avenue and toward the east part of the, of the community. And that, you know, those are the kind of people you might expect and want to go to the polls. So I think there was some politics involved in this. Plus, the folks in Brookside yeah. are very vocal, very organized. Yeah. They're very active in uh, politics. You're eliminating those people people that you right. talked about at the very beginning, Scott, who are going to be most objectionable to right. this to begin with. But, but so, to tie this back into an earlier discussion that we had, and I think Dave was the one who mentioned it, people in the Northland feel very detached from Kansas City, Missouri. And it's an interesting point to note that not once have we had any serious discussion about extending this line up into the Northland. It's going east, it's going south. But I mean, there's a reason Northlanders feel excluded from Kansas City, right. Missouri, and this is a classic example okay, uh, of it. Why, why is it not being considered north of the river? <laughs> because taking a streetcar across the river is enormously expensive. I mean, this is a thing that's 60 to $70 million a mile south of the river. It, it, the the okay. costs okay. really I, get I do need to move on, but one of the things, even in this <laughs> half a billion to do the eight miles, right is that half of that money would actually come from federal dollars, according to the article in the Kansas City Star today. That, Does that, that seem like, uh, go on, that's asking a lot, Scott? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Sorry, Stacey. And, and, and absolutely it does, Nick. And, and any idea that we're going to expand this further and, and hope that the federal government piggies up and, and, and annies up and, and gives us some of the money out of their piggy bank is ridiculous. Look, there's one question that needs to be asked here. What do we expect this to be? The idea that this is mass public transit is wrong. It simply needs to be something for visitors and tourists in a specified corridor in the city through entertainment districts because cities that have this successfully, like Portland, aren't trying to get millions of people on this. And we're not charging fares. This thing is going to be a tax dollar money suck forever. So it needs to be something that's very limited and for the purpose of visitors and tourists only, not to move residents of Kansas City all over the metro. Okay, it was to be one of Kansas Governor Sam Brownback's signature issues, free all-day kindergarten. He proposed it in his State of the State address, asked legislators to find $16 million to pay for it. It was also important to show he was pushing a big education initiative in an election year where he was opposed by House Democratic leader Paul Davis, who has been bashing him for his lack of support for schools. Well, this week, legislative leaders in Topeka say all-day kindergarten is now dead. They simply don't have the money, and to blame is the recent court rule they say that has left them scrambling to find $129 million to fix what Kansas Supreme Court justices argue is an unconstitutional wealth disparity between rich and poor school districts. But if Brownback really wanted this, couldn't he have pushed this? After all, aren't all both houses of the legislature overwhelmingly Republican, Dave Helling? Yes, they are. And yes, if he really wanted it, he could make a big issue out of it. I think it was proposed primarily for political reasons primarily in Johnson County, where a lot of voters and Republican voters live. They like the idea of all-day kindergarten. Uh, the expense was $16 million in the first year. It would expend, extend to about $80 million uh, when fully implemented. So it's possible that some Republicans are worried about the cost of it, Nick. But the governor has repeatedly said, hey, my tax cuts are going to bring in more money. So there ought to be plenty of money to do both all-day kindergarten and the court-ordered expenditures. You're seeing now legislators say they don't think that's going to be the case. Now they're even talking about for the money, for the even to fill that gap for the poor, the disparity between poor and rich districts to actually take money from existing school districts to pay for that. Right. In Johnson County. And the trade-off, at least on one house, is to allow those districts to raise taxes on their own. There is some cross-purpose here because, in essence, the governor has cut taxes, and now you're saying to solve that problem, go ahead and raise your local taxes. 
you know, it's all money, so I'm not sure what the efficacy of that will be, but that's the kind of argument they're having, and in that situation, Brownback gets the bump from being for all-day kindergarten, but maybe doesn't have to come up with the cost, and it's a political winner for him. Well, also in Kansas this week, Governor Brownback signs into law a bill limiting your ability to change political parties. The measure bars voters who register with one party from switching their affiliation from June 1st in an election year until after the August primary election. June 1st is the candidate filing deadline. Current law allows voters to change their registration up to two weeks before a primary. So is this to try and stop all those Democrats who change their party affiliation so they can vote in the more exciting GOP primary races, Scott? To an extent, I also think it's, you know, I haven't noticed a real problem regarding uh, Democrats switching over to the Republican Party uh, in the state of Kansas, but it has been a problem in other states, most notably uh, several years ago in the state of Ohio in, uh, in 2008, uh, where a number of people switch, Republicans switching over to the Democratic Party uh, in the state of Ohio. But I, it might be a solution looking for a problem. Garrett. There was a lot of discussion about this during the Republican presidential primary in Michigan, where folks who are supporters of Rick Santorum or Democrats who are opposed to Romney were switching over to try to prop up Santorum against Romney. This is part of a broader Republican effort nationwide to limit uh, who can vote and when and to restrict some of those voting rights. You see this in state after state after state to sort of narrow and make the voting process slightly more difficult for folks. I will say there's a possible side beneficiary to all this could be Pat Roberts in the state of Kansas. The Democrats would love to face Milton Wolf in a general election and not Pat Roberts. If there were ever going to be a big switch to support a Republican primary candidate, it would be Dr. Wolf. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.